would this work? So, okay. There we go. Yeah, it's looking like <laughs> we're we're rolling now. Look at that. You're in the movies now. Cool. Okay. Awesome. All right. Perfect. Hey, gang. Thanks for joining us. Uh, I'm joined today by my good friend Colton Woods, and we're trying uh, rather unsuccessfully to manage all of this technology stuff. Uh, <laughs> It's, it's once again a Zoom snafu here connecting to Facebook, uh, but we've got the backup. So we've got sort of this redneck setup looking over here where we're filming from the phone onto the computer so that we can be connected and both join you at the same time. Good morning, Biddy. Good to see you on there joining us. Um, so Colton, we've got, we've got some numbers rolling in. Um, it's a coffee conversation, so we're starting out. What are you, what are you drinking here this morning, Colton? I try to keep it pretty simple. I'm on a Folgers Black Silk. That's pretty much my go-to on every morning. So I like it about as strong as you can get it. And there you go. So. There you go. That's perfect. That's what I've got this morning, too. Oh, no so, kidding. <laughs> yeah. I, I like, um, for us addicts out there, I like that you can get that by, like, the five-pound jar, you know? <laughs> that's, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I pretty much can drink it. About, even if it's 90 degrees outside, I'm probably still drinking coffee. So. Yep, yep, absolutely. <laughs> cool, cool, good. I think I think maybe the only thing different about mine is I stuck a cinnamon stick in here. Do you have you have you done that? Do you do that at all, cinnamon? No, no, I can't say that I've I've gone. Sounds like sounds like it'd be pretty good, but I can't say I've done that. <laughs> mm, yeah, it's it's really good. I've um, I started that the first year in Portugal. Uh, they they had cinnamon sticks at the espresso machines and so i started dropping a cinnamon stick in there and i've kind of become addicted to it so now i now i buy a, a package of like a hundred cinnamon sticks at a time from amazon <laughs> <laughs> there you go. yeah yeah so cool so we've got quite a bit of people checking in um from all over good morning jenny good morning Lindsay. um so yeah gang let us know what you're drinking where you're coming from and, uh, and Colton, we want to talk about um, solid foundations on our horses today. We want to talk about what it takes to build a solid foundation. And um, I know that's a big piece that you're focusing on, right, with your program and, and what you're doing, what you're offering to folks, yeah? Yeah, that's, that is the, the foundation is the beginning of all of it, uh, regardless of how old your horses are, what discipline they're going in. And uh, we've actually, the our mission, like what we would tell everybody is to educate horses and people with a lifetime in mind. And so when we keep that at the forefront of everything that we do, our program is designed to not just educate the horses, but also educate the people. And so those solid foundations go into both of those realms to where we have a solid foundation as us as the horse person, as well as our horses developing the solid foundation. Because Ultimately, once you get into this stuff, if you don't have, if you yourself are lacking in kind of your foundation, it ends up showing up in our horses as well. And so, you know, we try to really help people that, you know, the horses that we train, they come with us, they come to us for a limited amount of time. And so we have time to put those solid foundations and help advance those horses, but they go home. Mm -hmm. And so we want to make sure that the people are set up for success when those horses go home. Or if you're doing a DIY type thing, and you're the one training your own horse, which honestly I'm kind of partial to. I think that's one of the best options because you get to develop not just the skills and the relate. You not you don't need to develop the skills with your horse or have a trainer develop the skills with your horse, but you get to develop like that relationship and that connection, and you get to really know each other. So it's something as simple as saying, "This isn't really normal. My horse is having an off day, or maybe I'm having an off day, and my horse mm -hmm. is letting me know that I'm really having an off day." And that you can develop with your horse. So, yeah, the solid foundations, I, I don't know where else to start <laughs> with a uh, horse yeah. other than starting with the foundation itself. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of the things that we experience that we, people are like, oh, we have trouble in the flying lead change. Or we have trouble with this or that. I always find myself going back to the foundation. And it doesn't matter whether it's a sliding stop, a turnaround, a canter pirouette, mm -hmm. lead change, whatever it's. When we're having issues that we can usually boil it down if we understand 
we can use like a cooking reference. If we understand what ingredients goes into baking the cake mm -hmm. and we understand what order we kind of, and how we need to use them, then yeah, then we can go down and reverse engineer everything go, okay, I think that's where that is stemming from. Go back, address it, and then get on to the fun, fancy stuff later on. But right, usually right. the fun, fancy stuff isn't really a problem once you have a, once you have the solid foundation. And it takes experience to really get the understanding and the insight to, oh, this isn't quite working as well as it, it could. And then mm -hmm. if I don't work on this now, it could lead to this problem later. That just comes from experience. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, that makes sense. And really, you know, when, when we're talking about that, all of the, you know, what you refer to as the fancy stuff, right? All the more advanced stuff as you go farther along, that's really just a continuation of the basic stuff, right? It's a continuation of that foundation that you've got put on them just understood to a higher level. Yeah, and I think, like, and I, I know I said the term fancy stuff, and a lot of times those maneuvers become kind of overwhelming to folks because mm -hmm. sometimes they're held on such a pedestal. But fortunately, the further I've got into the horsemanship, the more basic those things become mm -hmm. when you realize that I, I never played video games. I was never much of video games, but I look at it like a combination type exercise. If you're yeah. going to play a video game, you got A and you got B and you got C and you got D. And if you want a certain maneuver, you might do A plus B right? or A plus B plus C, mm -hmm. but you teach them all individually. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, I usually when you're doing, introducing those maneuvers, you're not changing a bunch of things at one time, right? You're trying to build those individual pieces and then say, Hey, you know how to do A and you know how to do B. So let's do A and B together. Mm -hmm. And the horse might have a little bit of trouble with it because they're like, this is kind of different, but it's like, it's different, but it's the same because I have already, you already have the understanding of what we're looking for. Mm -hmm. And that's where it gets fun because then we start to realize once we have those pieces, it's, it doesn't become as overwhelming to do those more high level maneuvers because we understand what goes into them. And when we find something that doesn't work quite right, we go, okay, that belong that, mm -hmm. that error belongs in this area. And we can go back and we have the understanding of how to fix it. Right. Right. You can diagnose and backtrack in that way. Yeah. 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 Well, that makes, that makes a lot of sense. So when we're, when we're talking about a solid foundation on your horse or, and or a solid foundation for the rider, what are the kind of things that you focus on? I know I, I end up um, inevitably at the dressage clinics and things like that. You know, we're trying to work on, like you said, the higher level things. And really there's some, a lot of times, some basic things missing that show up as problems later on when we're trying to touch on those more advanced things. So what are the things that you feel like you're focusing on most of the time to build that solid foundation for a horse? What are you looking for? What do you expect? Uh, the very first thing that I'm going for is to really have my horse present with me with what we're doing. And so okay. I just, we just started a new colt starting contract for our farm here in Lexington. And so we just started that this week, working with a lot of young horses to help them, whether they're yearlings or getting them started under mm -hmm. saddle. And so we've had a bunch of firsts with these horses mm -hmm. and when I got in the arena, a lot of them are thinking about being with their buddies. They're, they haven't been in the round pin before. And so my first thing when working with these horses is to really try to get them focused. And then ultimately, once they get more focused, they can relax. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that all builds on that <clears throat> presence of being there with me. If I don't have them with me, it's hard to do much. You're more doing things to them than with them. Mm -hmm. And so sure. what I've really found here in the last couple of years of developing horses, I – well, early on, you know, you could spin a leader and tap them on the hind end, or you could bump them across with a halter and say, hey, pay attention, pay attention. But the more that I've found I've done that with horses, sometimes the more resistant they get, uh, yeah. or maybe the little more emotional they get. Mm -hmm. So a lot of times I'll do something as simple as my horse is paying attention and looking left, and I'm standing on its right side. I might just pat my jeans or wave my arms or do something and just read and just do something to get them to go hey what are you doing mm -hmm. and usually their feet follow so i always start with that um with the, just getting them mentally there because the mental it, it's also connected and so we need their mind first usually sometimes we got to do work their feet to get to their mind and other times we got to play some mm -hmm. mind games to get to the feet and i know that you you say that probably on repeat about as much as i do <laughs> uh, with trying to develop any type of horse but <laughs> Um, yeah, so I always want to, I want to try to get their focus and it's one of those things that I, people a lot of times 
we start a session with a horse and we're like, you need to be here. Like I'm trying to focus on teaching you and the horse might be trotting around them, for example, mm, uh-huh. or the horse might come out and be a little fresh. One thing I've become really big on is I look at my horses and I look at where they're at for that day. And if they have a little extra energy, I don't try to stop it. I sure. try to say, what can I do in that moment to direct it? Mm-hmm. How can I guide that energy and use it towards something that I want to accomplish? Mm-hmm. And, you know, if it's a lot of extra energy, I'm going to do some groundwork. If it's just a little yeah. bit of extra energy, I, and I'm like, hey, I can, I can get on them, but we might go for a long trot. Or we might just start, mm-hmm. we might go out and kind of canter on a loose rein and just let them move and mm-hmm. go with them in that moment. So that when they're like, okay, I'm good. Thanks. You know, and you didn't create a fight. You didn't put any Mm -hmm. mental or physical resistance in there from trying to like, just say, by damn, like you need to be with me and do this, Mm -hmm. go with them a little bit. And then they go, well, usually what I have found time and time and time again is that they come right back to you and they're like, okay, all right, let's go to work. Yeah. And I think that's good because a lot of times we get so particular on just getting on them and them doing what we need them to do. Mm -hmm. And I feel like, when we go with them a little bit, they recognize that we recognized in them that they felt like they needed to move a little bit or whatever it is. I mean, mm-hmm. moving and having a little more forward is the most common thing that we'll see, I think, with a lot of these horses. And so when they recognize that we recognize that, I feel like they kind of check back in and they're a little more there with us because they're like, hey, you're in tune with that with me. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times when people bring me a horse and the horse is at a new environment, I'm like, Hey, let's just move them. Like let, they feel like they need to move. They want to check things out. Let's just go with it. Yeah. And we might direct it. We might say, Hey, let's go to the left. And if they run towards you, you might change directions and send them to the right. Um, but I always want to start with that focus, that relaxation, and then really get their mind with me. And then after that, a lot of it really can like start to click. Then we can start to focus on your foundation maneuvers of getting in touch with the body parts, being able to, yield the hind quarters or the shoulders or do a half pass or rein back or moving and forward into a contact and start to individualize things on particular maneuvers. But for me, it always, always, always starts with getting them with us in that present moment mm-hmm. and having that flexibility to go with them and get them to go with us later. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Well, and that makes a lot of sense when we think about, you know, I guess the way that we're talking about it here, you know, would bring me to mind to direction and redirection rather than suppression right because if you're just you know we we see it happen all the time uh that horse has got to go and somebody says just sit here just shut up and the the horse says yeah but i gotta go and the rider says just sit here just shut up and then eventually boom right the explosion happens or or maybe it's not an explosion but maybe it's just extra back tension and now we've got teeth grinding or now we've got contact issues or now we've got more tension in places and they're saying well geez you know my my half pass left or my lead change from right to left is really sticky when a lot of that could stem back not saying necessarily always does but a lot of it can stem back to that suppression where the horse was bothered the horse was unfocused and we just kind of rammed them and crammed them into a spot rather than recognizing like you're talking about recognizing when they needed to move their feet or recognizing when they needed to explore somewhere else a little bit just to get more confident and comfortable with them yeah i think even once you get into the riding part with your horse and i'd be curious to hear your thoughts on this but i have always when i come up with it when i think about these certain instances i have certain horses in mind that i've worked with on this type of thing But if I'm riding like a really young horse that gets a little worried about something, say you're riding them in the arena and they kind of jump at something on the outside of the rail Mm -hmm. that kind of catches them off guard. A lot of times for me in those moments, depending on where they're at in their education, if they're going to jump to the inside, I take my inside leg off Mm -hmm. and I don't. I don't even try to stop them because I, and it it usually comes from where's their mind. Are they leaving hard and fast? And they're like, Hey, that really spooked them. And then we can work on our body control and say, Hey, I'm still with you in that moment. You go with them. Mm -hmm. Or there's other moments with maybe a more advanced horse that, you know, Hey, if they, if they leave town that hard, that fast, they're mentally going to spiral into such Mm -hmm. a place that it's going to be hard for them to come back. Mm-hmm. And so a lot of times when I'm working with my horses, I've been saying this more recently is that my re- my responses to what my horse is doing, whether that's 
physically trying to move a, move a particular body part uh, or how I use my legs or my reins is so much determined by where my horse's mind goes. It's yeah. not so much about even where their feet are at mm-hmm. because if, if I start to feel that I mean, mentally they're starting to think a little bit behind themselves, like they're, they're kind of wondering what's happening behind them, not in a way that they're going to jump forward, but they're just, you can start, and I hate the word feel sometimes because it's so elusive, but you, you have that communication with your horse both ways and it really comes from just listening to them. Mm-hmm. And when you just can tell that their mind is kind of behind them, usually their feet slow down <laughs> or if their ears are really far forward and they're looking out the barn doors, Yep. Their gait might get a little longer, yep. or if yep. their neck, if they're going down the rail, and their <laughs> neck, their their neck snakes out to the outside. Their shoulders might come to the inside, but we know where the mind is going. And mm-hmm. so, so often, I find myself using an aid based on a thought process with my yeah. horses. So I yeah. start to feel where's <laughs> where the mind at? Because mm-hmm. the mind's going to go usually before the feet go mm-hmm. every time. And so when that becomes the case, when I start to th- see that thought process develop, then I adjust accordingly. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times that's even before the feet have made the adjustment. And so you're not micro, I don't feel like I'm micromanaging my horses, but I'm trying to develop my horses mentally based on, Hey, that's not a thought process we want to have. That's, that's not something we're trying to build because mm-hmm. I listen to Dr. Joe Dispenza a lot. And his, one of his main phrases is those, that wire together or those that fire together, wire together. So those Mm -hmm. thought processes that are firing Mm -hmm. in the same rhythmic pattern over and over and over Mm -hmm. become wired and they become very methodical, predictable type thought process. And some of those Mm -hmm. things we really want to, and that's why we do over and over and over and over and try to get those horses consistency and confidence. Mm -hmm. And other times I'm like, Hey, we don't want that as part of the thought process. Like, you know, rearing and running away is we're going to, I might make a, firmer correction in a moment where something is going to escalate because I'm trying mm-hmm. not to stop the horse physically, but mentally stop that thought process from wiring together and saying, Hey, yeah, yeah. that's not a neurological <laughs> impulse that we want to have. Right. So cut that off. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Redirect so I find that. myself, that's kind of how I've been responding to it more recently is mm-hmm. not so much writing them physically as I am writing them based on their mental thought process and then making my physical adjustments accordingly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that, that brings me to mind something that, um, Ray Hunt used to tell us all the time is that, you know, they learn what they live and they learn it in the way that they live it. Mm. Uh, which I think, you know, in spots like what you're talking here, if they're bothered or worried about something beside them or behind them or in front of them or whatever, that's going to influence how they're responding anyway, right? And so there, there you're talking about the, you know, the wiring together, firing together kind of idea. Um, I think of it sometimes like, um, like driving down the road, right? If you're, <clears throat> when we're talking about, you know, teaching resistance against your aids, basically, is kind of what it sounds like we're talking about here. If you present your aids at the wrong time, they almost can't help but find resistance, right? Like you're talking about yep. taking your leg off if they're going to spook sideways at something and you know it's coming up and you can prepare yourself. You can take that leg off and you can say, hey, I recognize that rather than holding that leg on and then having them fight against your leg. Now you're teaching them, right? They're learning what they live and they're learning it the way that they live it. They're learning, hey, something over there is bothering me. There's going to be resistance to the AIDS, right? That's that's the A plus B kind of idea, right? <clears throat> um so in those in those moments, I think about it similar to driving down the road, right? Like if you're driving down the road and it's a it's a normal average good day outside, and you touch your brakes, your car is going to slow down. If you're driving on ice and you touch your brakes, you might get a whole different story, right? It, it might be a, a completely different answer. And that you know, I think that's a lot like what you're talking about right here. Like you put that inside leg on, and things are going well your horse might be with you. You put that inside leg on and you're driving down the road that's that's got ice patches on it, you might get a different response, you know. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I like that idea, the fire together, wire together um, idea. And, and that, you know, that just takes me back to Ray's thoughts of they learn what they live and they learn it the way that they lived it. Mm. Yeah. And a lot of it can kind of sound <laughs> sometimes a little overwhelming when, when you're trying to, accomplish so much with our horses or just even in the moment you're like how do i adjust everything and i really try to boil it down in the foundation sense 
that'll serve us the rest of our lives with horses is just understanding how horses think <laughs> mm-hmm. like what really motivates them what worries like and not and i wouldn't even go into what worries them but understanding when they get worried why do they respond the way they do that way we can be a little more empathetic sometimes or just a little more aware of what is happening because I find so many times like the anthropomorphization and the people attributing our human qualities to our horses and something as simple as like, oh, he's yawning, oh, he's bored or we're, mm. you know, or whatever. And it's just like that. that's OK. If you're saying it and you're being sarcastic and funny, that's fine. But we often with those of us that understand that yawning is not a boredom thing. Right. right. You know, yawning is a relaxation, dopamine releasing. It's something we actually want to see. Um And I think that's just so important because a lot of times I find I'm guilty with my own horses. I know Mm -hmm. we all are. And we got to make sure that we're looking at things for what they are with our horses. And we're not infusing some extra feelings that aren't actually applicable to the situation. And Mm -hmm. then we're saying, hey, when my horse acts a certain way, is he responding to something that I've done or to something in his environment? Or is he trying to communicate something to me? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And I've been working with a horse that's been with me for quite a while. And still, he's gotten so much better. Because when he showed up, you go into a stall and he'd wheel around and double barrel at the stall door. Because he just hated people. Mm-hmm. Um, and I, But now, he's really sweet. But he still pins his ears when you walk past his stall. Mm-hmm. And anytime I catch him doing it, I just stop. I look at him. And a lot of times, I'll consciously just take a deep breath. Mm. or I might snap my fingers or pat my jeans depending on how intense the ear pinning is Mm -hmm. and it's been pretty fun to watch this horse change because before I'd have to sit there for like 10 minutes out in front of his stall and just wait on him okay and now it only takes about 5 to 15 seconds depending on how intense it is for him to go He'll look at me, and he'll look a little, and he'll get a little, he'll lean his neck towards me, and then he'll just take a big, deep breath, and then mm-hmm. his ears will pop forward. Awesome. And it's all associative, but he has mm-hmm. a very hard wiring mm-hmm. based on previous associations. Mm-hmm. And so sometimes, like, the adjustments that we have to make with our horses is very, very subtle, and it's just a matter of sometimes recognizing that, like, that horse was not aggressive, like, was is not aggressive, wasn't aggressive. But the ear pinning and staring at you like a like a dragon or a snake yeah. as you looks a little intimidating, but it's I perceived it more as a communication of he's not okay with you pushing that close into his space. Mm-hmm. So I just say, hey, I recognize that. Back off a little bit. Take a deep breath. He takes a deep breath, puts his ears forward, gets a completely. And sometimes he'll sit in a stall and yawn for five minutes afterwards, mm-hmm. even after I've walked away. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I think like those things, some of this stuff takes a while to change, but just understanding what is your horse actually doing? Not what you feel like your horse is doing or what you think your horse is doing, but try to understand from the foundational level. We have to, I mean, we're working with animals that have their own language of communication. That is something far more intricate than what we do. And they're so much more in tune with it so in tune that they can read horse behavior and they can read human behavior (laughs) and thoughts and feelings. You know, we can't hardly read our own species right? most of the time, right? Right. Nonetheless, working with a prey animal, which we're not. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And so understanding where your horse is truly coming from, you know, eating a slice of humble pie sometimes and realizing that we might have created some issues that we didn't intend to, but the blessing in that, is that now we get to fix them yeah. and that, you know, now you get to learn to do it. And some people, you can choose to be frustrated by it and that mm-hmm. <laughs> that's your own prerogative. But at the end of the day, it still has to be addressed. Mm-hmm. And sometimes we have to address ourselves first mm-hmm. with how we're doing what we're doing before we can get the change. And sometimes once we change ourselves, our horses go, thank you. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and right. they make the changes and mm-hmm. you don't have to work on your horse necessarily because you've changed the way you're operating. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Right. So when we're talking about this positive kind of uh, focus, this positive interaction, that sort of thing, what would you say are some qualities that you'd look for in in a horse that has a solid foundation of the things like, you know, their confidence as a learner, their 
their responsiveness or softness to your aids? What would be some of the things that you would, you know, if you were to, if you were to make a checklist of qualities, what would you, what would you say? Yeah. So first and foremost, I would start with where we kind of started this conversation with the presence, the relaxation, and the, the focus, all of those come together. When you get a horse focused, you'll get the relaxation and you'll get the presence and they start to be there more with you. After that, I want the understanding. So we would, of course, want to know how far educated, what does that horse actually know so that we could evaluate uh, um, where that horse is at. Does the horse truly understand what we think they should understand? Mm -hmm. And if they don't, then we realize, hey, we got some stuff to work on. Mm -hmm. But what is that horse's understanding in the, in the foundational principles of basically walk, trot, canter, you know, on a loose rein, be able to stop, back up, turn on the forehand, turn on the haunches, maybe a little bit of leg yield or half pass if you're working a gate on one. Um, and really just even today, my the way I develop young horses now versus when you first met me has totally changed. Mm. Um I think for the better. And it's so I put more into my foundations now than I did before as okay. far as trying to make sure I'm developing proper balance. And does the horse start, to, does they start, do they, from the very beginning, do they understand the basics of self, of self carriage? Mm. So that could be as simple as I'm not pedaling them when they're going. Okay. You know, that, mm -hmm. and that would be an understanding type principle on the ground and under saddle. When I ask them to go, do they just, they're still listening to where I'm asking them to go, but, do they carry themselves in those gates or am I having mm -hmm. to kick them for every stride? Okay. That to me mm -hmm. would not be at a very good understanding of going of forward momentum of having good impulsion and rhythm mm -hmm. because I'm having to do all the work and the resistance of the aim on my leg. They're, mm -hmm. And they're not just behind the leg, but they're pushing into it because they're not freely moving off. And that's going to be physical tension through the body. Mm -hmm. And it's first and foremost, mental tension. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I, you want the understanding, and once you can get a horse that, even if it doesn't look pretty, and you can tell that they're they're starting to get the hang of where they need to put their feet and what you're asking them to do, then it takes that consistency so that they can become more confident in that. Mm -hmm. They need a lot of practice, just like we do. Some horses need more practice than others, but we want to have the understanding, and then we want to have the confidence in that, and we want to have the willingness to do what we're asking them to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um you know, that's basically what I try to get after. I want a nice, I want a suppleness comes. I think that that yeah. is a subcategory of a strong foundation. To me, a strong foundation is really on the mental side mm -hmm. with used <clears throat> with developed by using some physical elements of what the horse needs to know when they go for us, when they go home, but what do they need to know? So I'll just do a quick caveat. Like my beginning was in equine rescue. I was working okay. with horses that didn't have any education and they couldn't find homes because they didn't have any education. Oh, so sure. a lot of right, times right. when I start to think about a solid foundation, what are the basic principles that every horse should know that is relatively easy to teach them mm -hmm. that no matter where they end up with anybody, <laughs> whether it's an FEI rider or somebody that wants to adopt a horse from a rescue, that they could end up in any of those homes and they would be wanted. Mm -hmm. That to me is the foundation principles of if you get hit by a car tomorrow, are your horses wanted? Do they have the foundational pieces that they're easy to be around for anybody? That means that some people, you know, might think they should know one or two other things. Other people go, I won't ever use that skill that that horse knows. Oh, That's yeah, fine. Sure. Right, right. Right. But do they have a mindset that makes them easy to be around all the time mm -hmm. and that they, they have the basics on the ground under saddle so that if anything were to happen and put them in a bit of a risky situation and somebody found out about it, they say, hey, I want that horse because I know that, like, I understand yep. that horse is easy to be around. That will keep a horse well out of a bad situation mm -hmm. any mm -hmm. day of the week. But it all really stems from that basic mental preparation of having that focus, that presence, that relaxation, the understanding, the willingness and the confidence to do whatever yeah. you're asking them to do. And then you can mm -hmm. go through and teach them all the maneuvers. Right, right, right. So when, when you're talking about this, as, as you're talking and as you're, as you're describing a lot of this stuff, it's kind of got my wheels turning. You know, we talk about self carriage, right? And, and when we're, when we're talking about self carriage from a literal perspective for the horse, we're talking about strength developed in balance, able to carry the rider, you know, and be in balance despite the extra weight of the rider. But it sounds a lot like what we're talking about right here is mental and emotional 
self-carriage, right? That self-regulation, that relaxation, yeah. that kind of commitment to being there as a partner, you know? Yeah, and I think like the, the physical side of it takes time. Mm -hmm, you know, sure. it, it takes a lot of time and I think you were the one that actually had told me as far as like developing a horse physically to where they can truly do it takes about 18 months mm -hmm, of mm -hmm. consecutive regular riding mm -hmm. that's a fair bit of time that's mm -hmm. a lot of time yeah and that, and that that's just time to develop a top line yeah absolutely yeah yeah right and so yeah and that means it's done properly mm -hmm, right <laughs> it started you from actually it, yeah. put the mm -hmm the proper type exercises and a proper development program together and initiated it five to six days a week, maybe, or however long what your horse would need for 18 months. Mm, I mean, yep. I know a lot of people that start and stop a lot of things in 18 months <laughs> and I'm one of them. Right. And so with that in mind, from the very beginning with our horses, when we're developing that, they physically, I mean, for a lot of the young horses I'm working with, they're right out of the field. Yeah. Right. right. And so they're not, physically going to necessarily have the physical capabilities of self carriage right mm -hmm. then. Some right. are built more apt for that type of carriage, mm -hmm. but at the, at the root basis, they can't do it necessarily, particularly when they're trying to get used to a rider on their back. Mm -hmm. But I can, from the very beginning, from a full or a yearling age, start to develop them mentally and emotionally in a way that they start to understand that they have a mental work ethic and philosophy about mm -hmm. what is being done with them mm -hmm. that will then later if they don't have that and they have the physical strength to do self carriage they can't do self carriage <laughs> right because right because they're not going to they're going to lack in the willingness to do it usually absolutely they're not going to have the emotional self carriage with it right right absolutely and so mm -hmm. the least i can do with the horses that i work with and fortunately we're blessed to keep performance horses for an extended period of time on some occasions mm -hmm. and i work with my own horses on this stuff they're staying around but the least that we can do is give them what you were saying is that emotional and that mental development stage because mm -hmm. whether they ever make it to self-carriage mm -hmm. at least they that will serve them in every realm from trailer loading to trail riding Bingo. to cross country to dressage to mm -hmm. work in a cow like it doesn't matter like that mm -hmm. is a mental philosophy on mm -hmm. I get up, I go to work, I understand why I want to do more. And it's important on how we do it. Like we can get willingness from a horse, but they can be a slave, right? Mm -hmm. Or Absolutely. we can get willingness from a horse because they want to do it and mm -hmm. they enjoy doing it. And it's because we've, we've worked with them in a way that we understand their communication back to us. And we, mm -hmm. we respond accordingly. Right. And that's where it's important to me on that is that our horses have the willingness because they want to do it, not just because – they're necessarily robots. Right, exactly. And that comes a lot down to how we build their confidence as learners. You know, it's just like, yeah. I feel like it's it's a lot like people, you know, if you build the confidence as a learner, they're going to try for you. They're going to they're gonna be showing up to work. They're going to have that emotional, mental fitness, that, that emotional, mental self-carriage that we're talking about here. Um, yeah. And I think that's really important based on what you said there because – we can't expose our horses to everything. Right. And we can't give them every experience. We don't know if we sell a horse, what they're going to encounter later on. And so with that in mind, we can give them a mental thought process and philosophy and fitness, as you put it, that they can utilize in a new situation that they've never encountered before, mm -hmm. because we have used consistency in how we work with our horse to coach them through multiple new experiences that we prepared them for. Right. But then we come across something new. We're like, hey, you haven't ever done this before? You've never crossed the tarp. You've never done whatever, gone mm -hmm. through a creek. Mm -hmm. And you've never done this before, but it's the exact same as this other thing. And we're going to navigate it the same way. And if you get really scared, I'm going to respond accordingly by being empathetic in that situation, but mm -hmm. still being here to guide you through it. Mm -hmm. And that's where... I think a lot of times as equestrians, we underestimate the amount of responsibility that that requires of us. Right. Because we can get very focused in the moment and we forget that that is not no longer dependent upon our horse, but mm -hmm. that, de that is dependent upon how we respond to our horse in those moments and making sure that we are doing it consistently, fairly. And the consistency becomes how we've done it in the past, not, how, what yeah. the right way to do it is it's mm -hmm. are we consistent on a day-to-day -day basis that our horse knows hey they're predictable because 
when this happens, they respond accordingly. Mm-hmm. And I think that's really important because then those horses have carryover into a lot of different situations, any, almost any situation that they encounter in the rest of their lives. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that makes perfect sense. So I'm looking at our time clock here, and I know that Meredith was laughing that we were going to go over time. And um, damn it, she's right. She's right. Yeah, we've she's we've done it again. It. We've done it again. You and I have gone over the time that we had anticipated. Um, but um, so we've we do, we do have a couple a uh, couple questions that came in. Do you think we can get through these couple questions pretty quick? Oh, yeah. We'll I'll bet we can. Sweet. It's going to be like speed <laughs> answers, right? Short That's and sweet. Right. The answer to every question is pick C, right? Um, so so Sheila sent in a question um, that when you're meeting a new horse, what are some good ways uh, to get the horse, uh, to get to know the horse so that they feel safe? What do you think about that? So I would always, I would start at the beginning, depending upon what I know about that horse. Um, if I didn't know that horse at all, then I'd go back to the beginning with some basic groundwork. But if someone mm-hmm. handed the horse and maybe you've seen the horse ridden or whatever the case may be, mm-hmm. then you have a you have an idea of where you need to start. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the first things is is just how does that or how do you and that horse interact when you're standing next to each other? Yeah. Um, that's really where it starts for me. Like if I'm holding the horse in the aisle way and the thing's looking over its shoulder and running and pushing into me or something like that. You know, people bring horses for lessons like that, and they're like, we really need help with this. Will you get on? And I'm like, absolutely, hell no. Right? right. You know, like, he has no idea I'm standing on the ground. Like, what's he going to think when I get on him? Like, right. And so I'm very particular about that kind of stuff. But, like, when you're, Sheila, when you're looking at getting him to know a new horse, I think it comes down to those first two things. Where is that horse mentally, physically, or mentally, physically, emotionally, spiritually, but where is that horse also and its focus and its relaxation and how present is it in the moment, mm-hmm. because that would then give me the beginning of confidence of, okay, if that horse checks those boxes, then we can go through some things. But if I don't have that, mm-hmm. then I'm working on that first. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. so, you know, it, it really is the communication with the horses. It's understanding how they communicate and what they're, what they're listening, whether they're communicating with you at all mm-hmm. <laughs> or right. if they are. Right. Um, yeah. But I don't really know necessarily if she's talking about on the ground or under saddle, but you know, there's a lot, there's groundwork exercises and trying to keep this short and sweet, Sheila. Like if you want to see some groundwork exercise that you could do with your horses, I have, we have a groundwork series that's already available online. Yeah. Right. Right. Okay. And so there's basic exercises on the ground on our YouTube channel. It's available for free and we're getting ready to launch an entire um, platform, which is going to, one of the sections is actually an entire groundwork fundamentals for the foundation and it's we've taken those five exercises and it's 13 exercises now and it's awesome. broken down piece by piece by piece it's how to's and then in that in that platform basically guys what it's going to have is case studies so you get the how to's you get to sit there and you get to watch me you get to watch the horses that know what they're doing so you can see what we're looking for mm-hmm. and then there's case studies with horses that don't know what we're what is being asked of them and you get to see the real live raw type footage that's going to say this is how we're working with horses and how we teach horses this that don't know this Mm. so sheila like if you're looking for particular exercises whether it's on the ground under saddle i would recommend checking that out but first and foremost i think rewatch the rest of this beginning of this conversation as far as getting to know the horse mentally Mm -hmm. and where they're at there Mm -hmm. so i mean what would you i'm curious patrick like what would you say in that Oh gosh! Um, as far as like, what would you what would you recommend for somebody yeah, trying to get to know a horse? I, I feel like you nailed it, and you definitely expanded on it more than probably where I might have, um, but but necessarily so, you know. Um, so, kind of helping that horse to feel safe, like you said, the groundwork, the the interaction that way. I would, I guess, I would add to that, and where my answer would probably go would be, you know, the safety can be presented in how we show up energetically, right? Mm. If if we're coming to that groundwork that you're talking about and our energy is all over the map, like we've seen <laughs> lots of people show up and do the right exercise, right? But they do it with the wrong energy and it just gets the horse jacked up and that sort of thing. So 
Um, and then you've seen people do maybe what you might call not the right exercise, but they show up in a better way energetically. And so the horse is able to just let down and, and level out. So I think, I think having that baseline of how you show up and interact energetically with the horse, I think is a really important piece to, to go with that and come into play with the exercises that you're talking about as well. Yeah. I think what you just said, that's first. Yeah, that yeah. becomes before what I said. Like that's the human factor that we have to have, right? Like, you know, whether you want to meditate or whatever you need to do to get yourself mm -hmm. in a good frame of mind that is just present with no expectations. Yeah, like what you said mm -hmm. first, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Cool, very cool. So Krista put in a question too that I think is really interesting, um, and I know you've got work to do, and and I do as well. So I want to. I don't want to go too long for us here, but it looks like we've got a lot of folks tuning in, listening to this too, that are enjoying awesome. this. So I don't want to cut it short for anybody either. Um, so uh, Chris's question would be: How do you differentiate between learned helplessness and mm -hmm. presence or teaching confidence? Um, that that's I think a really interesting thing. That learned helplessness is something that we see in horses. Um, where when we're talking about this kind of, I think takes us back to the beginning of our video where we were talking about, um, you know, the sit down, shut up kind of suppression versus expression and redirection. Um, what, how would you, if you're looking at a horse, how would you tell this horse is, uh, present, confident, uh, versus this horse, uh, is just in that learned helpless state kind of shut off, turned out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, that's that's an amazing question. Um, so first, I think it takes knowing the horse. You, mm -hmm. I think you can't just sometimes sometimes if it's blatantly obvious enough, you can you, you may not even know a horse, but you can look at it. And I'll get into like how you might be able to recognize it if it's blatantly obvious enough. But I think there are levels or phases or stages, if you will, of learned helplessness. And some horses might have it in certain areas, like some horses might have it in a trailer loading situation or they might have it in a particular maneuver in their riding because of how it's been presented, mm -hmm. but they may not overall be a shut down force per se. And they may not over, they may not be totally in this learned helplessness state, but there might be little pieces of the puzzle, which I think is far more common out there than it being the whole horse. Mm -hmm. Now there are the whole horses and I, and I would basically say, as I'm thinking through this, as uh, once you read that question, is that I would look at, is the horse communicating back yeah. to the rider? That's, that's where I'm looking for because horses will take learned helplessness and they'll deal with it in their own way. Some will mm -hmm. go internal and they'll hold the tension and they'll go to what you said a minute ago, Patrick, with the, with their present, but they're, they're gnashing their teeth or they're ulcery or mm -hmm. they're holding other more tension in their back, mm -hmm. you know, which might lead to lameness is or like whatever. But some of the more subtle signs that I feel like you have to know the horse a little bit better before you can just say, Hey, that's learned helplessness. I am mm -hmm. the further into this I get, the more open I am to watching and observing maybe for days or a couple of weeks before I have an opinion on, cause I want to have an educated opinion. I don't want to just be like, Oh, that's what that is. Mm -hmm. You know? Right. Right have a reaction to it like we want to respond to something in a helpful way and so is the horse communicating back to the rider now mm -hmm. i would say that and then we will go and look at some very advanced horses or maybe horses that are just really good minded and they might be doing exactly what the rider asked them to do with little to no emotion involved mm -hmm. but if you weren't sitting on that horse you would may not notice that horse communicating back mm -hmm. right they might have mm -hmm. a very soft eye and the horse and riding that horse would, could feel that horse adjusting accordingly and responding to what they're doing. But maybe the person on the rail couldn't see that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because that's the goal is that we're doing things to such a degree that it's not hardly noticeable. Right. And some horses are a little more forward in their expression while other horses are maybe are just way more laid back. And they might look what one horse might look mentally or they might look a little more shut down in a moment versus they could be right there with the rider. So I think this is something that we have to make sure as people that we're not reacting to and judging somebody on, or judging a horse 
just on first appearance because mm -hmm. there are times where if you look at a horse and they're just totally robotic and there's nothing in their eye and they're not responsive and you can usually watch for a few minutes and just see how the rider or the person on the ground works with them and you can probably figure out mm -hmm. where that horse is at but there might be times where another horse might have that same expression but be totally there with somebody mm -hmm. and yeah, the so, concentrated look mm -hmm. yeah so i think that it's it's a multifaceted type thing though. It's, there's not going to be any, like with anything with the horses and people in general, there's not any one way to locate it. But I think being able to say, Hey, I, I have this intuition that this horse might have this issue and then work. Don't be afraid. A lot of times I find this, I, I know we were trying to keep this short, but if you think your horse, if you're riding with your horse or working with your horse in an instance and you're like, Hey, I think my horse might be a little bit in a learned helplessness kind of state this morning. Don't stop what you're doing. Mm. like because you think that you don't know that yet so if you think that something's like try it again mm -hmm. and try it again mm -hmm. and try it again with your horse not because you're trying to put them in a learned helplessness state now you're more aware of what's happening in that moment and if right. you start to have enough experience with it you can say "Ooh, this horse whether because of my own fault or maybe the horse just went there mentally some maybe mm -hmm. they they went into a hole in their brain and they're just like hey i'm just gonna hide here mm -hmm. right, and right. And then you, now that you're more aware of it, you can help the horse in that moment. But don't be so quick to judge your horse or judge somebody else based on what you think. Like, make sure that you watch long enough and you observe long enough and you actually get enough information back to yourself so that you can then respond accordingly, which might be walking away and going, I'm not going to do it like that person. Mm -hmm. Or might be saying, hey, horse, I recognize that you're having this struggle. I'm more aware of it now, so let's help you get out of this. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah, I think that's that's really true. And, and I think it's important to explore and experiment there because there's going to be levels of responsiveness and levels of yeah. presence, right, uh, within that horse. And that's going to tell us a lot about where we are, where we maybe need to take a left turn somewhere and, and make our adjustments. Yeah. Absolutely. Cool. Very cool. Well, Colton, uh, we've got, I think we've got some other questions here, but I think we might just have to leave those for another day. What do you think? That means we're going to have to have coffee again. Yeah, it sounds like we might have to do this again. Keep <laughs> it to that 30 minutes. <laughs> it, yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. To keep us under a three hour mark. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> cool. All right. Well, um, any closing thoughts before we kick out here? Are you done with your coffee? I know mine's, mine's about last drop now. Yeah, I'm getting pretty low here. Um, but no, I, no, Patrick, I, I really appreciate you having me on this morning. It's always good to start the morning with connecting with somebody like yourself. We don't get to quite talk quite as much as I know we both like to. Nonetheless, right. get to ride together. But um, no, this is a real pleasure to kind of get the day started. We've still got horses to work and plenty of stuff to go. So this is kind of the espresso in my coffee this morning to kind of get, <laughs> get going the rest of the day and uh, – go enjoy it and remember i put a post yesterday of just remember why we got started in all of this yeah whether you got it whether you got into horses because they're a luxury like they're a hobby or because we do this professionally but just make sure you go out there and you have some fun with your horses and uh just don't lose sight of why we all started this in this place because it can no matter how serious you are about the horsemanship stuff or just whatever discipline you're in that it can get frustrating at times because we, we're always learning. We're trying to develop it. So, yeah, this is this has been fun. I really appreciate it. And I'm, I'm glad that there's extra questions because it gives us an excuse to do this again. So right. I'm, I'm exactly. really looking forward to it. Exactly. As if coffee isn't a good enough excuse to do this again. We also have, <laughs> we also have the questions, right? <laughs> cool. All right. Well, thank you, gang, for tuning in. Thank you so much. And, uh, yeah, we will do this again.